All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this event is hosted by LSE Ideas, which is the foreign policy think tank of the London School of Economics. And it is organized by the LSE Global Economic Governance Commission, which holds regular evidence sessions with experts from the academic world and from policymaking circles on some of the most important themes of global economic governance today. Issues like trade, monetary policy, development, climate, tax reform, and the topic of our panel today, uh, namely global debt. Um, the Commission also hosts special events, such as book interviews with distinguished scholars and policymakers. And if you're interested in staying up to date on any of their future events, please do make sure to follow them on Twitter at LSE underscore GEGC. So, Today's session concerns the debt crisis that is currently unfolding in low and middle income countries. And to discuss this topic, we are joined by two highly distinguished speakers, and I am personally extremely honored to be able to introduce them. Um, our first speaker today will be Joseph Stiglitz, university professor at Columbia University and a Nobel laureate in economics. He is a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, and a former member and chairman of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors. He is also the author of several books on globalization and economic policy, most recently, People, Power, and Profits, Progressive Capitalism for an Age of Discontent. Our second speaker will be Jayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, she was the chairperson of the Andhra Pradesh Commission on Farmers' Welfare in 2004 and a member of the National Knowledge Commission reporting to the Prime Minister of India between 2005 and 2009. She too is the author of numerous books on global development and a leading expert in the field of development economics. So it is a great pleasure to have both of these speakers with us today. Um, my name is Jerome Rose. I'm a fellow in international political economy at the Department of International Development here at the London School of Economics. And I've been asked by the organizers to start today's event with a short overview of how we got here and how this emerging market debt crisis evolved. Now, for those of us who've been following this topic for a while, it might seem a little bit like a Groundhog Day type of situation. It might seem like we've been here before. Clearly, this is not the first time that warnings of a major international debt crisis are being sounded and unfortunately have so far gone unheeded. In fact, in the past half century, there have been roughly four great waves of debt accumulation in the world economy. And unfortunately, all previous three of them have ended in a major international debt crisis. And clearly, there's a widespread concern that now the fourth wave, too, may end in such a crisis. Now, what is interesting for us as scholars of sovereign debt is that these basic debt waves seem to follow a same familiar pattern. Very simply put, at the risk of uh, oversimplification, we could say that there tends to be a buildup of debt in a period of low interest rates. Um, and that at some point, when these interest rates start going up, due to some external shock to the system, um, there is a spate of debt crises and default, defaults start occurring um, in, in large groups of countries. The first time we saw this dynamic work out was after the international lending spree of the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, which led in 1982 to the default of Mexico, and that quickly spread to become a major developing country debt crisis, primarily centered on Latin America, but also affecting countries elsewhere in the world. Now, unfortunately, the lessons of that crisis were not learned, and a very similar dynamic repeated itself in the 1990s, this time centered primarily on emerging market debt. And um, countries in Southeast Asia, Russia, Mexico, Brazil, and especially Argentina were particularly hard hit during the crises of the late 90s and early 2000s. Then a third wave came, um, basically in the wake of the bursting of the dot-com bubble and the 9-11 terror attacks. The US Federal Reserve lowered interest rates during the 2000s, and that then led to another huge buildup of debt within the system and a major crisis, starting with the global financial crisis of 2008, spreading to the Eurozone with the Eurozone debt crisis of the 2010s. Now, since then, since the global financial crisis, starting in roughly 2010, according to the World Bank, the world has seen the largest, fastest, and most broad-based increase in debt in emerging markets and developing economies of the last five decades. So again, we see a very similar dynamic playing itself out. And we currently possibly find ourselves at the tail end of that major lending spree 
And once again, it looks like that might be about to tip over into a wave of international debt crises. So according to the IMF and the World Bank, around 30% of developing countries and emerging markets, and as much as 60% of low-income countries are now either in or near debt distress. And the UK advocacy group Debt Justice, which has analyzed the data of the World Bank, says that based on the amount that their governments are currently spending on debt payments, people in 54 countries are currently living in debt crisis, with dozens more at risk of a public or private debt crisis in the months and years to come. So clearly, we are facing a very serious situation. How did we get here? Essentially, very briefly put, the current debt buildup was enabled by the historically low interest rates of the post-global financial crisis period. In a context where investors could not make a lot of profit by putting their investment in their own rich countries, they went on search for yield in the global south. And that led to a huge increase in credit availability for low and middle income borrowers and an enormous buildup of global debt. So that by 2019, global debt reached 233% of GDP, while government debt reached 84% of GDP. Um, as for global debt, that was already a record high, even before the pandemic. And according to many observers, it had reached the critical level. So debt burdens in middle income countries stood at a 30 year high and it was clear that any shock to the system could tip a large number of them over into crisis. The first warnings actually started emerging around this time. And then, of course, what happened is that the world was stuck by the COVID, struck by the COVID-19 pandemic, the response to which unleashed the deepest recession since World War II. Unfortunately, developing countries have been much more heavily hit by the economic consequences of the pandemic and have struggled to recover in the same way that many developed countries have started to recover. And what we've seen as a result is another huge increase in debt. Again, according to the World Bank, the pandemic has turned the fourth wave of debt into a tsunami, resulting in a debt buildup that is the largest in a generation. And then on top of that, as if all of that wasn't enough, of course, we saw the Ukraine war leading to skyrocketing food, fuel, and fertilizer prices. Um, which are especially problematic for developing countries dependent on imports of these key goods, um, which many of them are. So that is basically the crisis-ridden environment in which the US Federal Reserve and other leading central banks have begun to raise interest rates. And it is clear that developing countries now face a perfect storm. They're faced with rising US interest rates, leading to higher debt servicing costs, especially for those with debt contracted under variable interest rates. They're faced with depleting foreign exchange reserves due to the high price of imports. They're faced with capital flight as investors flee to safety, pull their money out of developing countries and pour it back into the developed countries. And as a result, they're also faced with a stronger dollar, uh, resulting in a rising real debt burden and um, uh, growing difficulties to continue servicing outstanding obligations. Now, clearly this crisis has been bubbling for a while. Experts have been warning about it for years, but now that this perfect storm is confronting um, developing countries, many are being tipped over the edge. We saw it with Sri Lanka uh, most recently, um, the most recent country to default uh, amidst widespread social unrest, hunger and serious economic problems. Uh, but Sri Lanka was not the first and it probably will not be the last country to be tipped into debt crisis. In fact, the World Bank warns that as many as 12 countries may default over the next 12 months alone. And if that were to materialize, it would probably be the most widespread debt crisis in a generation. Um, there have been some efforts to address the crisis, which we can hopefully discuss uh, later on in our discussion. Um, but so far, it seems that these, these have fallen woefully short. And that is basically the reason why we're here today to speak with Professor Stiglitz and Professor Gosch to try to analyze some of the underlying causes of the current wave of debt crises, and to speak about possible solutions to this problem. And with that, I would like to give the word first to Professor Stiglitz, uh, after that to Professor Ghosh. Um, and after their remarks, we'll have a short discussion between the panelists for about 15 minutes, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session with the audience. So if you do have any questions, please write them down, uh, share them with us in the Zoom chat, and uh, I will raise them with the panelists afterwards. Um, before we um, move on to Professor Stiglitz, I would just like to read out a short quote from a blog post by Marcelo Esteval, who is the global director of macroeconomics, trade and investment at the World Bank. Uh, 
And he asked recently, what drove the pre-COVID debt accumulation? And his answer was, let's be clear. It wasn't economic surprises that were beyond the government's ability to foresee. It was simply bad policy. Countries were simply spending beyond their means. Um, so I would like to invite both panelists to briefly reflect on that statement and to tell us what they make of what they make of that and what is their own interpretation of the underlying causes of the crisis. Um, with that, I would like to pass the word to Professor Stiglitz. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. And Jerome, you've laid out uh, the issues very clearly. Uh, let me begin uh, in a way by uh, answering uh, your question. Uh, you know, every loan is a voluntary uh, contract between a developing country, emerging market, and a creditor. And so if one blames the borrower, one needs to equally or even more blame the lender. And that's true of every one of the crises that we've confronted. You use the word search for yield. Uh, the creditors are supposed to be the experts. The banks get rewarded with mega uh, 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 incomes uh, in the millions of dollars because they're supposed to be experts in risk and the analysis of what countries can repay. Obviously countries want are desperate for money. And if a bank says you're qualified, they'll take the money. Uh, and uh, so uh, I put the onus not on bad policy as much as I do on bad financial market behavior. Um, they enticed the countries to get over indebted. Now, let's be clear, on both sides, the creditor and the lender, there are what we call agency problems. Those making the decisions do not necessarily act on behalf of those who they are supposed to represent. So particularly because of the very flawed incentive structures in the financial sector, many in the financial sector are prone to lend in a way that's excessively risky as we saw in the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, in that crisis, we all warned that there had to be a better design to the financial system, better regulation of the financial system, better contracts in the financial system. But while we improved things a little bit, we didn't uh, improve it enough. So I put, uh, as I say, the onus squarely with the financial sector. There's one more element in this particular crisis that makes it far more complex than earlier crises, actually two elements. The first is that we've moved from just bank lending to uh, bond lending, uh, multiple creditors. That's important because it will make the resolution of this debt crisis far more difficult than uh, the 1980s uh, Latin American uh, crisis, where the US government could shove the bankers into a room and <laughs> hammer out a deal with the Brady bond, huge subsidies to our banks in order to protect the American financial system. Uh, we, under, we as taxpayers undertook enormous risk uh, and the banks were not uh, adequately uh, punished. Uh, there's one more element though, which is the increasing role of China in making these loans. Uh, and many of the, these loans on the part of both the creditors, uh, uh, private creditors in the, in the West and in China are not transparent. So nobody knows how much is being lent. Uh, the levels of corruption in some cases are not insignificant. Um, others, because of the lack of transparency, can't judge fully the credit worthiness uh, of the countries. So uh, the, the uh, what this all means is that the difficulties of debt restructuring are going to be much greater than in previous crises. 
the at the center of the difficulties of debt restructuring are actually fights between the different creditors, uh, each wanting to get repaid as much as they can. Uh, and uh, here, um, there was a recognition that the system, the overall system, was dysfunctional in the earlier crises. But there was a fantasy that slight reforms dealing with collective action clauses would resolve the intracreditor problems. It did resolve some of the problems, but as the Argentine crisis showed, uh, the more recent Argentine crisis, not the one to which you referred, uh, showed those collective ac action clauses are not really adequate for dealing with uh, the full range of issues posed by uh, debt restructuring. I mean, after we should, that should have been obvious. No country relies on collective action clauses internally for the resolution of uh, uh, a debt, cry, uh, of debt problems. Uh, there is always a need for uh, bankruptcy courts, uh, uh, a, a, a legal framework for resolving uh, these conflicts. And we don't have that. Now, before turning to what policies might be uh, form, uh, put forward to address the issues, I want to emphasize that the cost of this debt crisis um, arises not just in the cases of like Sri Lanka, where it's all transparent, people can't get food, can't get uh, oil and uh, the country's in a political turmoil. Many other countries who have not tipped over the top are de facto in a debt crisis where servicing the debt is taking away money that would uh, enable the country to grow, to meet the basic needs of their citizens. Uh, and the consequences are almost as devastating as those country in the, uh, as the debt in those countries who've gone over the break. So we shouldn't just be focusing on the 12 countries that you mentioned that might go over the brink this year. We should focus on the hardship that this debt crisis has caused. Um, the final observation, just to reiterate uh, a similarity between the earlier crisis, the 1980s crisis and, and now, um, that the precipitating event for the uh, pushing all of the countries into debt, uh, into crisis in Latin America, almost all the countries, was the US government raising uh, the interest rates. And this time, it's not only the US government, but governments all over uh, the world raising interest rates at a rate more rapid than we've seen in a very long time. Uh, and as you say, uh, it, it uh, has a, a, a triple effects on these countries. It's the increased value of the dollar. Most of the debt is dollar denominated or hard currency denominated. It will, if it continues, lead or exacerbate a global economic slowdown, making it more difficult for them to repay their debt. And uh, of course, uh, the debt crisis will contribute to this global slowdown. And then finally, the higher interest rates themselves make uh, repayment of the debt uh, that much more difficult. So let me spend a few uh, uh, moments on what actions uh, need to be uh, undertaken. Basically, from all of the previous crises, we know uh, at least some of what needs to be done. Uh, I already mentioned that we have to go beyond the collective action clauses. Uh, we have to reform uh, the legal frameworks in the creditor countries. Uh, the New York uh, State legal, uh, New York State is the state in which a large number of these uh, debt contracts are written. Its legal structure actually discourages restructuring. There's a 9% prejudgment interest rate. And there are other provisions encouraging the holdout. Uh, uh, holdouts, the Champerty provisions uh, are uh, one example we can go into uh, uh, detail. We need a debt 
restructuring framework, as I said before. The UN in 2014 and 15 laid out the principles of what a debt restructuring framework should look like. The UN Commission that I chaired uh, urged uh, that kind of uh, a debt restructuring framework, but unfortunately, the creditor countries resisted. And as we face this crisis, as we faced earlier crisis, we have no such framework. There is a measure uh, where the international community has provided some help, which is the $650 billion of SDRs. But what is needed now are two things, uh, a new issuance of SDRs and a recycling of current SDRs to make sure that uh, those developing countries and emerging markets that most need it uh, uh, can get access to more of the SDRs. We also need to rethink the IMF programs. Many of the countries will inevitably go into IMF programs. Pakistan is already one. Uh, those programs in the past have imposed uh, austerity, uh, making it even more difficult for those countries uh, to uh, get out of, uh, to manage their debt. But even uh, as in Argentina, where they actually have a uh, relatively good program, uh, a break with the past, a good program, partly because the country's uh, economic minister uh, was uh, uh, able to formulate a, a program uh, that uh, uh, dealt well uh, with the debt. Uh, that country is burdened by the surcharges, uh, which have been imposed by the IMF uh, and uh, which uh, uh, make the I repayments to the IMF today uh, a major burden on countries rather than a help uh, for the countries. So there's a longer list of reforms that have been long on the agenda. Uh, we have to have better ways of handling country risks, that's especially important in light of climate change. Um, the high risk premium that individual countries face is an impediment for their ability to contribute to climate change. And we have to remember that unless the developing countries and emerging markets curb their emissions, the world uh, will not make much progress in fighting climate change. Um, it's necessary uh, to get access to capital. You emphasize the way financial markets work is very pro-cyclical. And so we have to develop a better financial system uh, for getting access in a counter-cyclical way to finance. Part of that would entail replacing the pro-cyclical rating agencies and dampening short-term capital flows. And finally, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we need more transparency in debt markets. Excellent, thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz, for that very clear outline. I think that offers plenty of um, ground for further discussion. Um, I would like to thereby pass the floor uh, to Professor Ghosh. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, asking me to be part of this. So, you know, Professor Stiglitz has made such a comprehensive and uh, elegant presentation that it's difficult to add more. Let me put in what I think are some, perhaps, some further reflections and footnotes on some of these points. And I want to begin, I must confess, with um, the statement that you quoted from the blog of the World Bank Economist, whose name I frankly don't remember. Uh, I want to agree with the first part. I think, yes, it was definitely a result of the wrong policies and disagree completely with the second part, uh, which is that it was all because the countries that are currently in debt crisis were spending beyond their means. So yes, it was because of wrong policies, but I would argue it's essentially because of the wrong policies of the advanced economies and the international financial institutions, which were cheerleading emerging markets to enter into various debt arrangements that were extremely risky, and which they were, I mean, it's not exactly loan pushing, but there was clearly an uh, effort to make sure that many, many developing countries who were either emerging markets or the new term was frontier markets or even riskier markets, would enter, uh, would liberalize their capital accounts, would enter into various kinds of 
allowing their own private sector to borrow from private sectors abroad, create sovereign bonds uh, on the grounds that, you know, all this is excellent because the financial market will know how to do it. And as Joe, as Professor Stiglitz has pointed out, they don't. They actually do not do this in an efficient way. They make a big mess of it. But let's also look at this thing about countries spending beyond their means. Let's look at what countries have spent during the pandemic, okay? On average, the advanced economies have spent anywhere between 10 to 30% of GDP additionally on fiscal stimuli. I mean, I don't know what the latest number is in the US because it keeps going up every time I look, but it was 26% additionally of GDP for 2021 and the first half of 20, uh, for 20 and the first half of 21. So it's a huge number, right? In, in Japan, also similarly, 32% of GDP was spent. Europe spent less than 22%, but okay. The middle income countries on average spent four to 6% of GDP additionally. Low income countries spent on average less than 2% of GDP. So we are talking about really, it's the rich countries that were spending beyond their means. Why don't they suffer? Because they happen to have globally acceptable currencies. In other words, they're not necessarily borrowing in the dollar or in hard currencies that they can't repay. That's the critical point. And so in fact, developing countries that got into debt were first of all encouraged, absolutely cheerlit by the international financial institutions, by the Davos crowd, by everybody to take on more debt. When the pandemic arrived and when then subsequently, the fallout of the Ukraine war, which was amplified by corporate profiteering and financial speculation, leading to food and, food and fuel price increases. Obviously, they were in a much, much worse situation. Pretty much all countries are affected, but food and fuel importing countries are hugely impacted. But in any case, all these countries have been hit by, as Joe, as Joe mentioned, by falling exports, falling remittances, falling export, tourism revenues, everything. And so clearly these are shocks that were beyond their um, uh, expectation and were unexpected, but it wasn't because they had been spending beyond their means necessarily any more than advanced economies had. So I think that's the first point. The second is that yes, it, I, I do feel that uh, many of these countries took on external debt way beyond, and it, it could be seen, Sri Lanka for sure, the writing was on the wall for about, uh, at least six to seven years. But you know, Sri Lanka has been under 16 IMF programs the last time I counted. Pretty much all the time it's been under an IMF program. The IMF is monitoring its borrowing. The IMF is encouraging it to borrow. The IMF is encouraging it to set up this extraordinary international sovereign bond system, which is you know, the latest Rajapaksha innovation, which has now uh, has become such a complete disaster. So you have these private financial corporations, Blackstone is a very big uh, element of this, holding these bonds, about a quarter of Sri Lanka's debt are, is these bonds. And the, what we find, which is extraordinary about all the private creditors, is that they will get higher returns because these are supposedly more risky. I think, you know, Joe mentioned this. These are more risky, so they are higher return. The search for higher yield brings you to all of these countries. So you're getting a higher return on your investments. You're getting a low valued bond or you're getting higher interest rates on these investments precisely because there's a higher risk of default. When the default happens, what do you do? You go running to mama, IMF, make them repay. So you're not willing, you have taken the benefit of the higher returns over all this period because it is a more risky debt. And when that risk materializes, you say, no, I want the full payment. And the international institutions help you to do that. So I think what is most frustrating for me in this particular crisis is that, you know, you could have seen it coming. I mean, uh, Professor Stiglitz and I and others, we were involved in a report more than a year and a half ago that said, look, there is going to be a major global debt crisis unless you do something about and, and restructure rather than just, uh, you know, um, kick the can down the road and uh, uh, reschedule. Yet they have done nothing. We have had two years when it was absolutely clear there will be an explosion of debt. And we have the IMF and the World Bank from January wringing their hands and saying, oh, this is terrible. Look at this. So many countries are going to default. Oh, isn't this awful? There will be poverty. There will be this. Why can't multilateral institutions that were created for this purpose get their act together and do something about it? 
instead of simply declaring all this tragedy and having played a very big part in creating it, I'm sorry to say. Um, there are several things I think that could be done. But uh, for me, the gold standard, I mean, Joe had written so much on possibilities of restructuring and the ways to restructure that I hesitate to even add anything to that. But, you know, for me, the gold standard of debt restructuring is the debt relief that Germany got in 1951. I think that was the, that was the kind of debt relief that we should be thinking about. And what did it get? It got half of its debt written off, effectively. The other half, some of it, uh, again, half of it was loans. The other part was, became grants. The loans were then converted into very long-term loans in which the uh, clear arrangement was that the debt servicing would not amount to more than 3% of the export value, which also created an incentive for all the creditor countries to want more exports from Germany. Now, it's true, the geopolitics of the time was such that that's why Germany got such a great deal. Greece was one of the creditors in that particular arrangement, by the way. But surely something that Germany was such a beneficiary of, at least a slightly lower level of that can be applied to countries that are facing crises that are beyond their control. I mean, if ever there were a case for compensatory financing, the IMF has a compensatory financing facility, which it hasn't used, I think, for two decades now. This is the case for that, because these are really things that have happened well beyond the control of any of the debtor countries. China keeps getting mentioned in all of the debt. Yes, China is a growing creditor. Most of China's uh, debts are actually, uh, loans are actually on much better terms and longer terms. But also in most cases of the countries in extreme distress, they are a very small proportion of the total debt. In Sri Lanka, it's not more than 10%. In some of the other countries that have defaulted um, in Lebanon or in uh, Belarus, it's a tiny proportion of their debt. So I don't think China is the problem. The, China, the problem is the private creditors. So we have to think of creative ways of dealing with these private creditors. So I would argue, in addition to you know, that kind of ideal debt restructuring for the official and multilateral debt, why don't we get a system where, let's say, the IMF buys up a lot of these bonds? I mean, the US Federal Reserve has been buying every bond in sight, right, for two or three years, uh, whether it's education loans or anything, they have been buying up debt over two years in the US. Why can't we have a global system that buys up distressed debt and somehow relieves or provides some relief to countries that are at the moment really at the mercy of these private financial markets in a way that it's going to be almost impossible to get out? Okay, let me stop here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there's some excellent and very provocative questions there that actually might open up a further discussion. Um, maybe we can return to those later. Uh, but I just wanted to start out by asking both of you a question about the actual initiatives that have been pursued in the wake of the pandemic um, to address some of these issues. Um, we had, of course, in at the height of the pandemic in 2020, the debt suspension, debt service suspension initiative. And um, that has now expired, and it was meant to be followed by a common framework um, on um, debt relief or some kind of debt arrangement. Um, what is your assessment of these two initiatives? Where have they fallen short? Um, what should be improved? And what are the odds of either of these of, of this common framework uh, succeeding um, moving forward? Let me let me begin by making a a, a, a brief comment. Uh, the debt sustainability uh, uh, suspension uh, initiative never got very far. Uh, the private sector really didn't participate, and uh, what has become has become clear: it isn't a matter of suspending payments. That initiative began when we thought the downturn was very short. Uh, it was going to be six weeks, eight weeks, uh, and uh, just a little bit of suspension uh, would help. Uh, it would have been important if there had been more participation. But what is so evident now, as you pointed out and as Jody pointed out, is what is needed is debt restructuring. And a framework for debt restructuring has not emerged. Professor Ghosh, do you wish to add anything to that? Uh, 
you're no you're i think unmuted. that's absolutely right no i'm i i, I unmuted now yes i know i think joe's absolutely right basically it just never really got off the ground it was dead on arrival practically and i think that's partly because it was a design flaw it there's a persistence that you know you can get voluntary participation in debt restructuring from private creditors i mean why on earth would that happen mm -hmm. so there is a real lack of you know i don't know awareness i i don't think you can get voluntary participation of this kind you would have well although some individual countries in including in africa say that they have managed to get better terms often from particular private uh, creditors than they have from the IMF, which is extremely rigid about repayment. But in general, you will not get that unless you bring in strong regulatory practices that force private creditors also to accept worse conditions. Now, mm -hmm. let me make a clear, the, uh, Argentina uh, illustrated that. Uh, that was a case where the IMF uh, did a debt sustainability analysis, which explained precisely how much uh, uh, Argentina could pay back. And uh, it was, I thought, slightly over optimistic, but it tried to outline, you know, you can't squeeze water out of a stone. And it said, how much can you get out of this, squeeze out uh, without uh, really disastrous consequences? And probably can't even squeeze that, that amount. Well, the private sector said, no, we want to squeeze harder and uh, the future be damned. Even if the country has more people died, that's their problem. And uh, it pushed beyond what any democratic government would have been able to accept. Uh, it was only because of a strong uh, international reaction to the private sector saying, you know, the IMF is doing the right thing here laying out how much the Argentina could pay. And there was enormous resistance. You know, the IMF traditionally have been uh, the debt collecting agency from the private sector. And when they changed to say, no, we're not going to be a debt collecting agency. We're gonna to try to uh, just make the fact clear what can be paid. Uh, they were furious, including from some of the private uh, creditors who had made a big pretense about being socially responsible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this reminds me also of the, the same sort of dynamic that we had around the time that Ann Kruger made a proposal for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, right? And there was this big pushback um, on the part of private creditors who felt like this was overstepping the boundaries of what the IMF was supposed to do. Um, I think that leads into sort of a, a broader problem here, because it also reminds me of what Professor Ghosh was saying in her remarks. Um, why can't multilateral institutions get their act together and do something about this problem? Uh, why can't we have a global system that buys up the debt? Um, to what extent is this a political question that is literally being stalled by private interests uh, within the rich world? Well, let me make a first stab uh, at that first. Let me say, uh, buying up debt is uh, an important instrument that has not been uh, adequately used, but uh, one has to be uh, careful about how much debt and what commitments to buy the debt one makes, because uh, excessive commitments simply are transferring of public money to the private creditors who've made bad loans. You don't want to buy so much that you bid up the price yeah. Yeah. to the uh, uh, to to basically bail out the private creditors. So it is a partial solution, but an important tool that has not been adequately used, and one that can uh, really relieve and has been used in some instances for relieving the burden on developing uh, countries. Um, the answer to your question is pretty obvious. Why was it that a, a, the UN principles that were overwhelmingly ratified by the General Assembly of the UN were resisted by just a few creditor countries? Well, why did the creditor countries do it? It's because of the influence in those creditor countries of private financial markets and 
Uh, it's the private sector that has the view that for most countries, there is an imbalance of power. Uh, in the fight between Wall Street and London and a small developing country, Wall Street and the creditors believe they will win. But if we had a bankruptcy court that tried to fairly adjudicate these disputes, things will come out differently. So the financial sector believes in what you might call the law of the jungle because they win. Within our countries, no country has said we will have the law of the jungle. We all have, uh, every country almost, has a bankruptcy court to resolve what happens when uh, debtors can't repay the creditors. Yes, I think, I mean, I agree with everything. Absolutely, that, that's the point. So like that being sort of the structural context in which we have to operate, obviously we're trying to come up with solutions. We're trying to think through what are the possible sort of ways to address this. It would seem to me, uh, Professor Stiglitz mentioned at some point, uh, the, the the current sort of non-system, uh, the solution that private creditors came up with, with these collective action clauses um, that still leave the ball within the creditor's court. Um, if that is not adequate, we need some kind of uh, sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms. How likely do you see that being in the present context in light of that creditor resistance that we're talking about? Um, is there, do you see any sort of political constituency emerging or a potential Perhaps maybe the shift in international um, relations towards a, a broader creditor base um, that might alter this political dynamic. Um, do you are you hopeful about the possibility of some kind of mechanism emerging? Okay, let me let me give a view which I I'm not sure Joe will agree with. So let me just start out with what I think. There are two things. One is, of course, I think what I would like to happen. And I think both Joe and I are very much on the same page on that in terms of the kinds of debt restructuring we would like to see and the, the, the changed role of the IMF in terms of changed conditionalities, which maybe I should come back to it at some point, that you can't stick with the old counterproductive conditionalities based on a flawed model. You have to have different conditionalities based on perhaps you know green investments, based on global public goods based on uh, protecting the, uh, the situation of the poor, the vulnerable women, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's one set of things. But what is likely to happen, I think, is, is a bit different. And here, you know, okay, maybe I'm, let me be frank. I mean, I, this is, a, this is a, a, a formal public discussion, but you know, still, I think one of the things that has happened in the last year is that the G7 has kind of lost it geopolitically. Let me uh, suggest that you know the obsession with the Ukraine war, the demand that everybody has to side with them on with respect to the sanctions, the requirements of you know uh, the 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 implications for trade and fragmentation and so on, have really meant that more and more countries in the developing world are looking for alternative trade arrangements. They're looking for alternative trade financing and uh, export credit arrangements, they're looking for alternative financial arrangements as well. The number of bilateral and other currency swap deals has exploded in the last eight months. Um, I never thought I would see, uh, you know, the decline of dollar hegemony begin with actions from the US, but it seems to be that this is the kind of thing that is emerging. If that is the case, and you know, everybody says, oh, look at China, there have been these exploitative lenders and so on. Supposing, I'm saying, supposing China says, well, you know, we will give you debt forgiveness or we will postpone your payments. We will do some the following. And Russia says, we will give you cheap oil and so on and so forth. You, will, you could actually get different kinds of uh, responses emerging. I don't know if that's such a bad thing, given the extreme uh, cynicism with which G7 has tended to treat the rest of the world from the pandemic onwards. Uh, there is a real lack of faith in multilateralism now among large parts of the developing world, <laughs> simply because it's very it's seen as something very top down, driven by G7, which is ultimately looking after its own interests rather than those of the world. 
Uh, I think it's very unfortunate given the fact that our problems are global and we need to have multilateral solutions. But I think the likely tendency will be as more and more countries face this extreme distress, and as more and more countries then come up against this wall of refusal to deal with the debt restructuring and refusal to change the very rigid and oppressive and unproductive conditionalities that are imposed by the IMF, that you're going to get many more alternative solutions. People are going to swim around the big fish, you know? Let me make uh, just a couple of comments. <clears throat> uh, and uh, they're, they're based uh, maybe on unrealistic optimism about uh, the way that the world order might go. <clears throat> I've been consistently uh, wrong in my optimism so far, so I don't want to put <clears throat> too much weight on it, but some of what I'm going to say uh, is consistent with, with uh, uh, what Jayati said, but I also want to say that we are at a very delicate moment where things could go uh, either way. And I think we all recognize the deep uncertainty uh, which we face. The problems, in, as we've already said, the problems in global governance in many ways come back to problems in national governance. If you ask most Americans, uh, do they uh, feel empathy for those who are poor, who, who are uh, uh, lacking food and healthcare in the pandemic? Uh, they would say yes. I think a majority of Americans would have strongly supported providing vaccines and the intellectual property behind the vaccines to developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, not doing that, of course, came back to bite us as more mutations uh, developed, which uh, have hurt us. So I think that there is a greater empathy among most people in a bank's countries than is evidenced in our public policy because our public policy is driven uh, in the case of debt by the financial institutions, in the case of vaccine policy by the pharmaceutical companies uh, and so forth. Uh, in many develop developed countries in the United States, there is a large progressive movement. Uh, that has uh, been advocating uh, policies which are more supportive of the, uh, the developing countries and emerging mar markets. There is strong effort within the US Congress, for instance, for another issuance of SDRs that would help developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, there is opposition to austerity. There's opposition to uh, the IMF surcharges. Uh, issues that seem arcane have gotten a lot of congressional uh, support. So at one level, I'm optimistic that uh, the progressives, as you might call them, in the developed countries uh, will win the day and that would make an enormous change. But anybody looking at politics in America realizes how precarious it is. Uh, it, it, it could go absolutely the other way and uh, things could get much, much worse. In the global scene, uh, there are also two uh, uh, forces at work. Uh, and uh, I think Jadi is pointing to both of them. As we face climate change, as we've just been through the experience of the pandemic, I think we all realize the importance of global cooperation. As we're fighting a war in Ukraine for democracy, we realize the importance of global cooperation. But we can't have global cooperation unless we cooperate. And part of cooperation is get, uh, uh, cooperation getting a, a framework for sovereign debt restructuring. Uh, we have to show our goodwill. And so far, we failed. We failed in the vaccine. And I think that failure in the vaccine has contributed to the fracturing of the global community. So we need to show our solidarity. And, and, and I think many Americans realize this. And uh, that would help facilitate creating that uh, uh, 
um, uh, global uh, framework. Moreover, again, as Gotti pointed out, the reality is that we are also moving to a new Cold War uh, in the aftermath of the end of the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, 1990. Uh, before that, there was competition for the hearts and minds of the developing countries. Uh, then it seemed as if there was one superpower and uh, there was no competition. And I think that lack of competition meant that our economic interests prevailed. Uh, or let me put it more broad, uh, uh, precisely, the economic interests of our financial and multinational sector prevailed. Now, we are in a world where it, once again, we're going to be fighting for the hearts and minds of those in the developing countries and emerging markets. And if that is the case, we will have to again show more empathy, or at least pretend to have more empathy. <laughs> we'll have to have rules that are fairer. And so both from the need of global cooperation in a self-interested way and in response to the new Cold War, I'm optimistic that we might be able to get towards a better debt framework. I'm glad to hear that there's still some optimism uh, in the world, uh, yeah. Professor Stieglitz. Thank you very much. I would like to um, use these last minutes that we have to um, introduce a couple of questions from our audience. Um, we received quite a few, some of them are quite long, so it's difficult for me to quickly go over them, but I do see an interesting one here from Kanchana Ruanpura, uh, who is a researcher, um, let's see, I think at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, who asks a question for either Professor Stiglitz or Professor Ghosh, or both. Uh, speaking of Sri Lanka, I want to also bring in and inquire what are the chances of exploring the concept of odious or illegitimate debt? Why is this not part of the debt justice discourse? To make corrupt politicians made culpable. Not just risky lenders, creditors, but also the politicians themselves. I think that's a great question. Uh, in some of my earlier work writing, like in making globalization work, uh, I argued strongly uh, that we ought to be talking about odious debt. Uh, the particular context, uh, one example that I used in some of my earlier writing was uh, Ethiopia, where uh, Ethiopia was forced uh, to pay that back the debt uh, that was owed to Russia, as Russia gave money to Ethiopia, uh, lent money to Ethiopia to suppress the democratic revolution that was going on in that country and to support. Uh, the uh, uh, dirge regime, which was called the Red Terror. Uh, you know, to have to pay for your murderers' uh, weapons uh, seems to me particularly odious. And I, I, I thought that was a good example. Uh, there are many, else, uh, many other examples uh, around the world. Yeah, I, I want to agree with Joe. I think absolutely there is a strong case for arguing for odious debt. And in the case of Sri Lanka, definitely the Rajapakshas clearly were siphoning off money, clearly were extremely corrupt and nepotistic, and clearly took a lot of that debt uh, for, into their own private coffers. But you know, one of the problems is precisely that Sri Lanka, only 40% of the debt is bilateral or multilateral now. 60% is private, and about half of that is in bond markets. It's really complicated now to say uh, this part is odious and that part, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a more complex scenario now because of the dramatic increase in private creditors across all developing countries, not just Sri Lanka, but particularly in the Sri Lankan case. I think though there is a strong case for, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to advise anyone in Sri Lanka, but I think there is a case for people in Sri Lanka to say, well, you know, we're not going to, repay some of this debt. We are not, we're, we're not repaying some of these bonds. And yes, we will be squeezed out of bond markets for now. But if we can manage to get whatever we need in terms of foreign exchange at the very minimum, 
and do the basic debt service to some of the other official creditors, then we're not going to bother with that bond payment for now. Because let's face it, the point I made earlier, these are all private creditors who took advantage of the higher risk to get higher returns over decades. And then they want to get exactly the same full repayment as if there were never any risk. You can't have it both ways. You can't get a higher return because it's risky and then say, well, I refuse to accept any risk. Yeah, let me add one thing to uh, what John said, which I agree with totally. Uh, having a provision for not repaying ODO's debt, debt where you know that the money is going into corrupt hands would provide better incentives and give the creditor better incentives to make sure the money was going uh, uh, to uh, the benefit of the people in the country. You're muted, Jerome. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, we, we have about two or three minutes left. Um, so I'm just gonna pick out a few questions at random. Unfortunately, we can't touch upon all of them. But here's one from Tatiana Lisenko, who writes that it seems to me that things have changed since the last debt crisis in at least two ways. In particular, many large systemically important emerging markets are now borrowing in local currency rather than in US dollars. And if we compare the previous episodes of rising global interest rates, EM external accounts are generally in better shape today with smaller current account deficits or current account surpluses. Could you please comment on, on this question? So I guess the question is, are emerging markets more resilient today uh, than they were before because of this domestic borrowing? Uh, Joe, do you want to go first? Well, I, the answer is some are. <laughs> uh, there are some countries uh, that are in a better position because their uh, current account uh, is, uh, position is better and they borrow in local currency, uh, but many are not. And even countries that have borrowed in uh, local currency uh, are now facing uh, problems that while they can always repay in local currency, uh, that would have inflationary effects uh, or could have. And in a world where inflation is already at levels that are uh, of concern, uh, that will be uh, both economically and politically unattractive. Yeah, and I just want to add to that, that you know, once you have open capital accounts, this borrowing in local currency doesn't really save you. Because yes, you can repay that debt, but you can still get capital flight. And I think one of the problems with the difficulties of emerging markets today is that the, the threat of capital flight is real. I mean, in India, our, our currency has just depreciated another 7% over the last month. Uh, we've lost another 70 billion in reserves as the central bank has been trying to do open market operations to somehow mm -hmm. prop up the rupee. And we are supposedly a country that is not in this trend. I can tell you that within the economy, there is massive distress. There is massive, there's a livelihood crisis, an employment crisis, a hunger crisis, and all of that. But in terms of the macroeconomics, we seem all right. However, we are being battered by the fear of capital flight and the actuality of capital flight as well, because interest rates get, as, as Joe said, are being raised so sharply and so dramatically every month now that we are going to get, be getting more and more of an outward flow. So it's, you know, they are not in better shape just because the macroeconomic fundamentals appear all right. They're actually still extremely fragile because of these open capital accounts that the IMF and everybody else encouraged them to have. Um, um... I'm aware of the time. We are officially uh, out of time, but I just wanted to raise one more question because I think it's a it's an interesting one perhaps to end on. It's by Pavlos Rufos, who is a PhD candidate at Castle University. He writes, debt restructuring is not merely a rational policy choice that is missing because of a lack of awareness. Um, then he mentions, he mentions my book, um, the very idea of debt restructuring, according to Jerome, um, uh, has been consistently undermined by an economic system that compensates falling profitability with financial innovations. My question to all would be, beyond a legal framework, 
what would be the necessary social and political requirements that could reimpose or reintroduce the historical reality of debt restructuring in today's environment. So I suppose going back to what Professor Ghosh mentioned as the sort of gold standard of debt restructuring in the context of the post-war period, the German debt restructuring, how could we get back socially and politically to this type of bold initiative? Let me go first and then Johnny can, can uh, you know, take that example. Uh, why did we do it? It wasn't just uh, solidarity with Germany that we'd just been fighting for uh, years. Uh, it was because we learned a lesson from what happened in World War I, where uh, a common interpretation was that the reparations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles and the other uh, uh, post-World War I uh, agreements uh, as Keynes warned, uh, led to uh, uh, economic turmoil in Germany that contributed to the rise of Hitler. And we didn't want to repeat that history. So it was fear that generated uh, solidarity, if you want to think about that way. Mm. Uh, I think what we've uh, just outlined and answer to one of the earlier questions is that uh, we have uh, strong reasons within the advanced countries for wanting to cooperate for solidarity, the need to solve the problem of climate change. And we have fear and competition with those who have a, a political system that many of us do not think of as one that we would like to live under. So that both uh, uh, empathy, uh, the need for solidarity to solve global problems and the fear that if we don't do that, uh, we will lose out provide, I think, strong motivations. And internally in the United States and in other advanced countries, there are strong forces of progressives who realize this. But as I said, uh, it's clear that uh, the politics is contested and it is not clear who will prevail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to agree with Joe's guarded optimism, I think, on this one. Also because I think, you know, otherwise we're really facing apocalypse. So I think if you believe humanity will ultimately step back from the brink, whether it's the climate or, you know, or, or all of these, tremendous catastrophes around us, then you have to think that enlightened self-interest will prevail. And basically what Joe has been saying is that, that it's, it is in the enlightened self-interest of advanced economies to do the cooperative thing. And at some point they have to see it. I mean, otherwise we're all doomed. And I don't think we can all sort of imagine that we're all doomed. I do believe humanity <laughs> steps back from the brink. So, so therefore, yes, I, I go with Joe's guarded optimism. I think that's a great note to end on uh, for our discussion today. I want to thank both panelists for their very, very interesting contributions and their remarks and the answers to the questions. I want to ask, I want to uh, also thank all the participants, the, the audience uh, for sending their questions and for tuning in today. Um, I think this is the last event that the commission will be holding uh, this summer, uh, but they will be back in September. So please do tune in again after this summer. Thank you very much. <laughs>